Where are the enemy? Benjamin waved his hand expansively. Over there. Benjamin spoke English. Terrible English. But where? According to my ideas of trench warfare, the fascists would be fifty or a hundred yards away. I could see nothing. Seemingly their trenches were very well concealed. Then, with a shock of dismay, I saw where Benjamin was pointing. On the opposite hilltop, beyond the ravine, seven hundred metres away at the very least, the tiny outline of a parapet and a red and yellow flag, the fascist position. I was indescribably disappointed. We were nowhere near them. At that range, our rifles were completely useless. But at this moment, there was a shout of excitement. Two fascists, greyish figurines in the distance, were scrambling up the naked hillside opposite. Benjamin grabbed the nearest man's rifle, took aim, and pulled the trigger. Click. A dud cartridge. I thought it a bad omen. The new sentries were no sooner in the trench than they began firing a terrific fusillade at nothing in particular. I could see the fascists, tiny as ants, dodging to and fro behind their parapet, and sometimes a black dot, which was ahead, would pause for a moment, impudently exposed. It was obviously no use firing, but presently the sentry on my left, leaving his post in the typical Spanish fashion, sidled up to me and began urging me to fire. I tried to explain that at that range, and with these rifles, you could not hit a man except by accident. But he was only a child, and he kept motioning with his rifle towards one of the dots, grinning as eagerly as a dog that expects a pebble to be thrown. Finally, I put my sights up to seven hundred and let fly. The dot disappeared. I hope it went near enough to make him jump. It was the first time in my life that I had fired a gun at a human being. Now that I had seen the front, I was profoundly disgusted. They called this war, and we were hardly even in touch with the enemy. I made no attempt to keep my head below the level of the trench. A little while later, however, a bullet shot past my ear with a vicious crack and banged into the paradise behind. Alas, I ducked. All my life I had sworn that I would not duck the first time a bullet passed over me. But the movement appears to be instinctive, and almost everybody does it at least once. Chapter 3 In trench warfare, five things are important. Firewood, food, tobacco, candles, and the enemy. In winter, on the Saragossa front, they were important in that order, with the enemy a bad last. Except at night, when a surprise attack was always conceivable, nobody bothered about the enemy. They were simply remote black insects whom one occasionally saw hopping to and fro. The real preoccupation of both armies was trying to keep warm. I ought to say in passing that all the time I was in Spain I saw very little fighting. I was on the Aragon front from January to May, and between January and late March, little or nothing happened on that front, except at Teruel. In March, there was heavy fighting round Huesca, but I personally played only a minor part in it. Later in June, there was the disastrous attack on Huesca in which several thousand men were killed in a single day, but I had been wounded and disabled before that happened. The things that one normally thinks of as the horrors of war seldom happened to me. No aeroplane ever dropped a bomb anywhere near me, and I do not think a shell ever exploded within fifty yards of me, and I was only in hand-to-hand -hand fighting once. Once is once too often, I may say. Of course, I was often under heavy machine-gun fire, but usually at longish ranges. Even at Wesco you were generally safe enough if you took reasonable precautions— up here, in the hills round Saragossa, it was simply the mingled boredom and discomfort of stationary warfare, a life as uneventful as a city clerk's, and almost as regular. Sentry go, patrols, digging, digging, patrols, sentry go. On every hilltop, fascist or loyalist, a lot of ragged, dirty men shivering round their flag and trying to keep warm. And all day and night the meaningless bullets, wandering across the empty valleys, and only by some rare, improbable chance getting home on a human body. Often I used to gaze round the wintry landscape and marvel at the futility of it all, the inconclusiveness of such a kind of war. 
Earlier, about October, there had been savage fighting for all these hills. Then, because the lack of men and arms, especially artillery, made any large-scale operation impossible, each army had dug itself in and settled down on the hilltops it had won. Over to our right, there was a small outpost, also POUM, and on the spur to our left, at seven o'clock of us, a PSUC position faced a taller spur, with several small fascist posts dotted on its peaks. The so-called line zigzagged to and fro in a pattern that would have been quite unintelligible if every position had not flown a flag. The POUM and PSUC flags were red, those of the anarchists red and black. The fascists generally flew the monarchist flag, red, yellow, red, but occasionally they flew the flag of the Republic, red, yellow, purple. The scenery was stupendous if you could forget that every mountain top was occupied by troops and was therefore littered with tin cans and crusted with dung. To the right of us, the Sierra bent southeastwards and made way for the wide, veined valley that stretched across to Huesca. In the middle of the plain, a few tiny cubes sprawled like a throw of dice. This was the town of Robres, which was in loyalist possession. Often in the mornings, the valley was hidden under seas of cloud, out of which the hills rose flat and blue, giving the landscape a strange resemblance to a photographic negative. Beyond Huesca, there were more hills of the same formation as our own, streaked with a pattern of snow which altered day by day. In the far distance, the monstrous peaks of the Pyrenees, where the snow never melts, seemed to float upon nothing. Even down in the plain everything looked dead and bare. The hills opposite us were grey and wrinkled like the skins of elephants. Almost always the sky was empty of birds. I do not think I have ever seen a country where there were so few birds. The only birds one saw at any time were a kind of magpie, and the coveys of partridges that startled one at night with their sudden whirring, and very rarely the flights of eagles that drifted slowly over, generally followed by rifle shots, which they did not deign to notice. At night, and in misty weather, patrols were sent out in the valley between ourselves and the fascists. The job was not popular, it was too cold and too easy to get lost, and I soon found that I could get leave to go out on patrol as often as I wished. In the huge, jagged ravines there were no paths or tracks of any kind, you could only find your way about by making successive journeys and noting fresh landmarks each time. As the bullet flies, the nearest fascist post was 700 metres from our own, but it was a mile and a half by the only practicable route. It was rather fun wandering about the dark valleys with the stray bullets flying high overhead like red shanks whistling. Better than night time were the heavy mists, which often lasted all day, and which had a habit of clinging round the hilltops and leaving the valleys clear. When you were anywhere near the fascist lines, you had to creep at a snail's pace. It was very difficult to move quietly on those hillsides among the crackling shrubs and tinkling limestones. It was only at the third or fourth attempt that I managed to find my way to the fascist lines. The mist was very thick, and I crept up to the barbed wire to listen. I could hear the fascists talking and singing inside. Then, to my alarm, I heard several of them coming down the hill towards me. I cowered behind a bush that suddenly seemed very small, and tried to cock my rifle without noise. However, they branched off and did not come within sight of me. Behind the bush where I was hiding, I came upon various relics of the earlier fighting, a pile of empty cartridge cases, a leather cap with a bullet hole in it, and a red flag, obviously one of our own. I took it back to the position where it was unsentimentally torn up for cleaning rags. I had been made a corporal, or cabo, as it was called, as soon as we reached the front, and was in command of a guard of twelve men. It was no sinecure, especially at first. The Centurio was an untrained mob, composed mostly of boys in their teens. Here and there in the militia you came across children as young as eleven or twelve usually refugees from fascist territory who had been enlisted as militiamen as the easiest way of providing for them. As a rule, they were employed on light work in the rear, but sometimes they managed to worm their way to the front line where they were a public menace. I remember one little brute throwing a hand grenade into the dugout fire for a joke. At Monteposero, I do not think there was anyone younger than fifteen, 
but the average age must have been well under twenty. Boys of this age ought never to be used in the front line because they cannot stand the lack of sleep which is inseparable from trench warfare. At the beginning it was almost impossible to keep our position properly guarded at night. The wretched children of my section could only be roused by dragging them out of their dugouts feet foremost, and as soon as your back was turned they left their posts and slipped into shelter. Or they would even, in spite of the frightful cold, lean up against the wall of the trench and fall fast asleep. Luckily the enemy were very unenterprising. There were nights when it seemed to me that our position could be stormed by twenty Boy Scouts armed with air guns, or twenty girl guides armed with battle doors, for that matter. At this time, and until much later, the Catalan militias were still on the same basis as they had been at the beginning of the war. In the early days of Franco's revolt, the militias had been hurriedly raised by the various trade unions and political parties. Each was essentially a political organization, owing allegiance to its party as much as to the central government. When the popular army, which was a non-political army organized on more or less ordinary lines, was raised at the beginning of 1937, the party militias were theoretically incorporated in it, but for a long time the only changes that occurred were on paper. The new popular army troops did not reach the Aragon front in any numbers till June, and until that time the militia system remained unchanged. The essential point of the system was social equality between officers and men. Everyone from general to private drew the same pay, ate the same food, wore the same clothes, and mingled on terms of complete equality. If you wanted to slap the general commanding the division on the back and ask him for a cigarette, you could do so, and no one thought it curious. In theory, at any rate, each militia was a democracy and not a hierarchy. It was understood that orders had to be obeyed, but it was also understood that when you gave an order, you gave it as comrade to comrade and not as superior to inferior. There were officers and NCOs, but there was no military rank in the ordinary sense, no titles, no badges, no heel-clicking and saluting. They had attempted to produce within the militias a sort of temporary working model of the classless society. Of course, there was not perfect equality, but there was a nearer approach to it than I had ever seen or than I would have thought conceivable in time of war. But I admit that at first sight the state of affairs at the front horrified me. How on earth could the war be won by an army of this type? It was what everyone was saying at the time, and though it was true, it was also unreasonable, for in the circumstances the militias could not have been much better than they were. A modern mechanized army does not spring up out of the ground, and if the government had waited until it had trained troops at its disposal, Franco would never have been resisted. Later it became the fashion to decry the militias, and therefore to pretend that the faults which were due to lack of training and weapons were the result of the equalitarian system. Actually, a newly raised draft of militia was an undisciplined mob, not because the officers called the privates comrade, but because raw troops are always an undisciplined mob. In practice, the democratic, revolutionary type of discipline is more reliable than might be expected. In a workers' army, discipline is theoretically voluntary. It is based on class loyalty, whereas the discipline of a bourgeois conscript army is based ultimately on fear. The popular army that replaced the militias was midway between the two types. In the militias, the bullying and abuse that go on in an ordinary army would never have been tolerated for a moment. The normal military punishments existed, but they were only invoked for very serious offences. When a man refused to obey an order, you did not immediately get him punished. You first appealed to him in the name of comradeship. Cynical people with no experience of handling men will say instantly that this would never work. But as a matter of fact, it does work in the long run. The discipline of even the worst drafts of militia visibly improved as time went on. In January, the job of keeping a dozen raw recruits up to the mark almost turned my hair grey. In May, for a short while, I was acting lieutenant in command of about thirty men, English and Spanish. We had all been under fire for months, and I never had the slightest difficulty in getting an order obeyed, or in getting men to volunteer for a dangerous job. Revolutionary discipline depends on political consciousness, on an understanding of why orders must be obeyed. It takes time to diffuse this, 
but it also takes time to drill a man into an automaton on the barrack square. The journalists who sneered at the militia system seldom remembered that the militias had to hold the line while the popular army was training in the rear, and it is a tribute to the strength of revolutionary discipline that the militias stayed in the field at all. For until about June 1937, there was nothing to keep them there except class loyalty. Individual deserters could be shot, were shot occasionally, but if a thousand men had decided to walk out of the line together, there was no force to stop them. A conscript army in the same circumstances, with its battle police removed, would have melted away. Yet the militias held the line, though God knows they won very few victories, and even individual desertions were not common. In four or five months in the Poom militia, I only heard of four men deserting, and two of those were fairly certainly spies who had enlisted to obtain information. At the beginning, the apparent chaos, the general lack of training, the fact that you often had to argue for five minutes before you could get an order obeyed, appalled and infuriated me. I had British Army ideas, and certainly the Spanish militias were very unlike the British Army. But considering the circumstances, they were better troops than one had any right to expect. Meanwhile, firewood, always firewood. Throughout that period, there is probably no entry in my diary that does not mention firewood, or rather the lack of it. We were between two and three thousand feet above sea level. It was midwinter, and the cold was unspeakable. The temperature was not exceptionally low. On many nights, it didn't even freeze, and the wintry sun often shone for an hour in the middle of the day. But even if it was not really cold, I assure you that it seemed so. Sometimes there were shrieking winds that tore your cap off and twisted your hair in all directions. Sometimes there were mists that poured into the trench like a liquid and seemed to penetrate your bones. Frequently it rained, and even a quarter of an hour's rain was enough to make conditions intolerable. The thin skin of earth over the limestone turned promptly into a slippery grease, and as you were always walking on a slope, it was impossible to keep your footing. On dark nights I have often fallen half a dozen times in twenty yards, and this was dangerous because it meant that the lock of one's rifle became jammed with mud. For days together clothes, boots, blankets and rifles were more or less coated with mud. I had brought as many thick clothes as I could carry, but many of the men were terribly underclad. For the whole garrison, about a hundred men, there were only twelve greatcoats, which had to be handed from sentry to sentry and most of the men had only one blanket. One icy night I made a list in my diary of the clothes I was wearing. It is of some interest as showing the amount of clothes the human body can carry. I was wearing a thick vest and pants, a flannel shirt, two pullovers, a woolen jacket, a pigskin jacket, corduroy breeches, putties, thick socks, boots, a stout trench coat, a muffler, lined leather gloves and a woolen cap. Nevertheless, I was shivering like a jelly. But I admit I am unusually sensitive to cold. Firewood was the one thing that really mattered. The point about the firewood was that there was practically no firewood to be had. Our miserable mountain hadn't even at its best much vegetation, and for months it had been ranged over by freezing militiamen with the result that everything thicker than one's finger had long since been burnt. When we were not eating, sleeping, on guard or on fatigue duty, we were in the valley behind the position, scrounging for fuel. All my memories of that time are memories of scrambling up and down the almost perpendicular slopes, over the jagged limestone that knocked one's boots to pieces, pouncing eagerly on tiny twigs of wood. Three people searching for a couple of hours could collect enough fuel to keep the dugout fire alight for about an hour. The eagerness of our search for firewood turned us all into botanists. We classified according to their burning qualities every plant that grew on the mountainside. The various heaths and grasses that were good to start a fire with but burnt out in a few minutes, the wild rosemary and the tiny whin bushes that would burn when the fire was well alight, the stunted oak tree, smaller than a gooseberry bush that was practically unburnable. There was a kind of dried-up reed that was very good for starting fires with, but these grew only on the hilltop to the left of the position and you had to go under fire to get them. 
If the fascist machine gunners saw you, they gave you a drum of ammunition all to yourself. Generally their aim was high and the bullets sang overhead like birds, but sometimes they crackled and chipped the limestone uncomfortably close, whereupon you flung yourself on your face. You went on gathering reeds, however, nothing mattered in comparison with firewood. Beside the cold, the other discomforts seemed petty. Of course, all of us were permanently dirty. Our water, like our food, came on muleback from Alcibieri, and each man's share worked out at about a quarter day. It was beastly water, hardly more transparent than milk. Theoretically, it was for drinking only, but I always stole a pannikin full for washing in the mornings. I used to wash one day and shave the next. There was never enough water for both. The position stank abominably, and outside the little enclosure of the barricade there was excrement everywhere. Some of the militiamen habitually defecated in the trench, a disgusting thing when one had to walk round in the darkness. But the dirt never worried me. Dirt is a thing people make too much fuss about. It is astonishing how quickly you get used to doing without a handkerchief and to eating out of the tin pannikin in which you also wash. Nor was sleeping in one's clothes any hardship after a day or two. Of course, it was impossible to take one's clothes, and especially one's boots off at night. One had to be ready to turn out instantly in case of an attack. In eighty nights I only took my clothes off three times, though I did occasionally manage to get them off in the daytime. It was too cold for lice as yet, but rats and mice abounded. It is often said that you don't find rats and mice in the same place, but you do when there's enough food for them. In other ways we were not badly off. The food was good enough, and there was plenty of wine. Cigarettes were still being issued at the rate of a packet a day, matches were issued every other day, and there was even an issue of candles. They were very thin candles, like those on a Christmas cake and were popularly supposed to have been looted from churches. Every dugout was issued daily with three inches of candle, which would burn for about twenty minutes. At that time it was still possible to buy candles, and I had brought several pounds of them with me. Later on the famine for matches and candles made life a misery. You don't realise the importance of these things until you lack them. In a night alarm, for instance, when everyone in the dugout is scrambling for his rifle and treading on everybody else's face, being able to strike a light may make the difference between life and death. Every militiaman possessed a tinder lighter and several yards of yellow wick. Next to his rifle, it was his most important possession. The tinder lighters had the great advantage that they could be struck in a wind, but they would only smoulder so that they were no use for lighting a fire. When the match famine was at its worst, our only way of producing a flame was to pull the bullet out of a cartridge and touch the cordite off with a tinder lighter. It was an extraordinary life that we were living. An extraordinary way to be at war, if you could call it war. The whole militia chafed against the inaction and clamoured constantly to know why we were not allowed to attack. But it was perfectly obvious that there would be no battle for a long while yet unless the enemy started it. Georges Kopp, on his periodical tours of inspection, was quite frank with us. This is not a war, he used to say. It is a comic opera with an occasional death. As a matter of fact, the stagnation on the Aragon front had political causes of which I knew nothing at the time. But the purely military difficulties, quite apart from the lack of reserves of men, were obvious to anybody. To begin with, there was the nature of the country. The front line, ours and the fascists, lay in positions of immense natural strength, which as a rule could only be approached from one side. Provided a few trenches have been dug, such places cannot be taken by infantry, except in overwhelming numbers. In our own position, or most of those round us, a dozen men with two machine guns could have held off a battalion. Perched on the hilltops as we were, we should have made lovely marks for artillery, but there was no artillery. Sometimes I used to gaze round the landscape and long, oh, how passionately for a couple of batteries of guns. One could have destroyed the enemy positions one after another as easily as smashing nuts with a hammer. But on our side the guns simply did not exist. The fascists did occasionally manage to bring a gun or two from Saragossa and fire a very few shells, so few that they never even found the range and the shells plunged harmlessly into the empty ravines. Against machine guns and without artillery, there are only three things you can do.
Dig yourself in at a safe distance, 400 yards, say. Advance across the open and be massacred. Or make small-scale night attacks that will not alter the general situation. Practically, the alternatives are stagnation or suicide. And beyond this, there was the complete lack of war materials of every description. It needs an effort to realize how badly the militias were armed at this time. Any public school OTC in England is far more like a modern army than we were. The badness of our weapons was so astonishing that it is worth recording in detail. For this sector of the front, the entire artillery consisted of four trench mortars with fifteen rounds for each gun. Of course, they were far too precious to be fired, and the mortars were kept in Alcibiere. There were machine guns at the rate of approximately one to fifty men. They were oldish guns, but fairly accurate, up to three or four hundred yards. Beyond this, we had only rifles, and the majority of the rifles were scrap iron. There were three types of rifle in use. The first was the long Mauser. These were seldom less than twenty years old, their sights were about as much use as a broken speedometer, and in most of them the rifling was hopelessly corroded. About one rifle in ten was not bad, however. Then there was the short Mauser, or Mousqueton, really a cavalry weapon. These were more popular than the others because they were lighter to carry and less nuisance in a trench, also because they were comparatively new and looked efficient. Actually, they were almost useless. They were made out of reassembled parts. No boat belonged to its rifle, and three-quarters of them could be counted on to jam after five shots. There were also a few Winchester rifles. These were nice to shoot with, but they were wildly inaccurate, and as their cartridges had no clips, they could only be fired one shot at a time. Ammunition was so scarce that each man entering the line was only issued with fifty rounds, and most of it was exceedingly bad. The Spanish-made cartridges were all refills and would jam even the best rifles. The Mexican cartridges were better and were therefore reserved for the machine guns. Best of all was the German-made ammunition. But as this came only from prisoners and deserters, there wasn't much of it. I always kept a clip of German or Mexican ammunition in my pocket for use in an emergency. But in practice, when the emergency came, I seldom fired my rifle. I was too frightened of the beastly thing jamming and too anxious to reserve at any rate one round that would go off. We had no tin hats, no bayonets, hardly any revolvers or pistols, and not more than one bomb between five or ten men. The bomb in use at this time was a frightful object known as the FAI bomb, it having been produced by the anarchists in the early days of the war. It was on the principle of a Mills bomb, but the lever was held down not by a pin but by a piece of tape. You broke the tape and then got rid of the bomb with the utmost possible speed. It was said of these bombs that they were impartial. They killed the man they were thrown at and the man who threw them. There were several other types, even more primitive, but probably a little less dangerous. To the thrower, I mean. It was not till late March that I saw a bomb worth throwing. And apart from weapons, there was a shortage of all the minor necessities of war. We had no maps or charts, for instance. Spain has never been fully surveyed, and the only detailed maps of this area were the old military ones, which were almost all in the possession of the fascists. We had no rangefinders, no telescopes, no periscopes, no field glasses, except a few privately owned pairs, no flares or very lights, no wire cutters, no armourer's tools, hardly even any cleaning materials. The Spanish seemed never to have heard of a pull-through, and looked on in surprise when I constructed one. When you wanted your rifle cleaned, you took it to the sergeant, who possessed a long brass ramrod, which was invariably bent, and therefore scratched the rifling. There was not even any gun oil. You greased your rifle with olive oil when you could get hold of it, at different times I've greased mine with Vaseline, with cold cream, and even with bacon fat. Moreover, there were no lanterns or electric torches. At this time there was not, I believe, such a thing as an electric torch throughout the whole of our sector of the front, and you couldn't even buy one nearer than Barcelona, but only with difficulty even there. As time went on, and the desultory rifle fire rattled among the hills, I began to wonder with increasing scepticism whether anything would ever happen to bring a bit of life 
or rather a bit of death, into this cockeyed war. It was pneumonia that we were fighting against, not against men. When the trenches are more than five hundred yards apart, no one gets hit except by accident. Of course there were casualties, but the majority of them were self-inflicted. If I remember rightly, the first five men I saw wounded in Spain were all wounded by our own weapons. I don't mean intentionally, but owing to accident or carelessness. Our worn-out rifles were a danger in themselves. Some of them had a nasty trick of going off if the butt was tapped on the ground. I saw a man shoot himself through the hand owing to this. And in the darkness the raw recruits were always firing at one another. One evening, when it was barely even dusk, a sentry let fly at me from a distance of twenty yards. But he missed me by a yard. Goodness knows how many times the Spanish standard of marksmanship has saved my life. Another time I had gone out on patrol in the mist, and had carefully warned the guard commander beforehand, but in coming back I stumbled against a bush. The startled sentry called out that the fascists were coming, and I had the pleasure of hearing the guard commander order everyone to open rapid fire in my direction. Of course I lay down and the bullets went harmlessly over me. Nothing will convince a Spaniard, at least a young Spaniard, that firearms are dangerous. Once, rather later than this, I was photographing some machine gunners with their gun, which was pointed directly towards me. Don't fire, I said half-jokingly as I focused the camera. Oh no, we won't fire. The next moment there was a frightful roar, and a stream of bullets tore past my face so close that my cheek was stung by grains of cordite. It was unintentional, but the machine gunners considered it a great joke. Yet only a few days earlier they had seen a mule driver accidentally shot by a political delegate who was playing the fool with an automatic pistol, and had put five bullets in the mule driver's lungs. The difficult passwords which the army was using at this time were a minor source of danger. They were those tiresome double passwords in which one word has to be answered by another. Usually they were of an elevating and revolutionary nature, such as cultura progresso, or seremos invencibles, and it was often impossible to get illiterate sentries to remember those highfalutin words. One night, I remember, the password was Catalunya heroica, and a moon-faced peasant lad named Jaime Dominic approached me, greatly puzzled, and asked me to explain. Heroica. What does heroica mean? I told him that it meant the same as valiente. A little while later he was stumbling up the trench in the darkness, and the sentry challenged him. Alto! Catalunya! Valiente! yelled Jaime, certain that he was saying the right thing. Bang! However, the sentry missed him. In this war, everyone always did miss everyone else when it was humanly possible. Chapter 4 When I had been about three weeks in the line, a contingent of twenty or thirty men sent out from England by the ILP arrived at Alcibiere, and in order to keep the English on this front together, Williams and I were sent to join them. Our new position was at Monte Oscuro, several miles farther west and within sight of Saragossa. The position was perched on a sort of razorback of limestone with dugouts driven horizontally into the cliff like sand martins' nests. They went into the ground for prodigious distances, and inside they were pitch dark and so low that you couldn't even kneel in them, let alone stand. On the peaks to the left of us there were two more poom positions, one of them an object of fascination to every man in the line, because there were three militia women there who did the cooking. These women were not exactly beautiful, but it was found necessary to put the position out of bounds to men of other companies. Five hundred yards to our right there was a PSUC post at the bend of the Alcibiere Road. It was just here that the road changed hands. At night you could watch the lamps of our supply lorries winding out from Alcibiere, and simultaneously those of the fascists coming from Zaragoza. You could see Zaragoza itself, a thin string of lights like the lighted portholes of a ship, twelve miles southwestward. The government troops had gazed at it from that distance since August 1936, and they're gazing at it still. There were about thirty of ourselves, including one Spaniard, Ramon, William's brother-in-law, and there were a dozen Spanish machine gunners. Apart from the one or two inevitable nuisances, for, as everyone knows, war attracts riffraff, the English were an exceptionally good crowd, both physically and mentally. Perhaps the best of the bunch was Bob Smilly, 
the grandson of the famous miners' leader, who afterwards died such an evil and meaningless death in Valencia. It says a lot for the Spanish character that the English and the Spaniards always got on well together in spite of the language difficulty. All Spaniards, we discovered, knew two English expressions. One was, OK, baby. The other was a word used by the Barcelona whores in their dealings with English sailors, and I'm afraid the compositors would not print it. Once again, there was nothing happening all along the line, only the random crack of bullets and, very rarely, the crash of a fascist mortar that sent everyone running to the top trench to see which hill the shells were bursting on. The enemy was somewhat closer to us here, perhaps three or four hundred yards away. Their nearest position was exactly opposite ours, with a machine-gun nest whose loopholes constantly tempted one to waste cartridges. The fascists seldom bothered with rifle shots, but sent bursts of accurate machine-gun fire at anyone who exposed himself. Nevertheless, it was ten days or more before we had our first casualty. The troops opposite us were Spaniards, but according to the deserters there were a few German NCOs among them. At some time in the past there had also been Moors there. Poor devils, how they must have felt the cold. For out in no man's land there was a dead Moor who was one of the sights of the locality. A mile or two to the left of us the line ceased to be continuous, and there was a tract of country, lower lying and thickly wooded, which belonged neither to the fascists nor ourselves. Both we and they used to make patrols through there. It was not bad fun in a Boy Scoutish way, though I never saw a fascist patrol nearer than several hundred yards. By a lot of crawling on your belly you could work your way partly through the fascist lines, and could even see the farmhouse flying the monarchist flag, which was the local fascist headquarters. Occasionally we gave it a rifle volley and then slipped into cover before the machine guns could locate us. I hope we broke a few windows, but it was a good eight hundred metres away, and with our rifles you couldn't make sure of hitting even a house at that range. The weather was mostly clear and cold, sometimes sunny at midday, but always cold. Here and there in the soil of the hillsides you found the green beaks of wild crocuses or irises poking through. Evidently spring was coming, but coming very slowly. The nights were colder than ever. Coming off guard in the small hours, we used to rake together what was left of the cookhouse fire and then stand in the red-hot embers. It was bad for your boots, but it was very good for your feet. But there were mornings when the sight of the dawn among the mountain tops made it almost worthwhile to be out of bed at godless hours. I hate mountains, even from a spectacular point of view. But sometimes the dawn breaking behind the hilltops in our rear, the first narrow streaks of gold, like swords slitting the darkness, and then the growing light and the seas of carmine clouds stretching away into inconceivable distances were worth watching even when you had been up all night, when your legs were numb from the knees down and you were suddenly reflecting that there was no hope of food for another three hours. I saw the dawn oftener during this campaign than during the rest of my life put together, or during the part that's to come, I hope. We were short-handed here, which meant longer guards and more fatigues. I was beginning to suffer a little from the lack of sleep, which is inevitable even in the quietest kind of war. Apart from guard duties and patrols, there were constant night alarms and stand-tos, and in any case you can't sleep properly in a beastly hole in the ground with your feet aching with the cold. In my first three or four months in the line, I don't suppose I had more than a dozen periods of twenty-four hours that were completely without sleep. On the other hand, I certainly did not have a dozen nights of full sleep. Twenty or thirty hours sleep in a week was quite a normal amount. The effects of this were not so bad as might be expected. One grew very stupid, and the job of climbing up and down the hills grew harder instead of easier. But one felt well, and one was constantly hungry. Heavens, how hungry! All food seemed good, even the eternal arico beans, which everyone in Spain finally learned to hate the sight of. Our water, what there was of it, came from miles away, on the backs of mules or little persecuted donkeys. For some reason the arrogant peasants treated their mules well, but their donkeys abominably. If a donkey refused to go, it was quite usual to kick him in the testicles. The issue of candles had ceased and matches were running short. The Spaniards taught us how to make olive oil lamps out of a condensed milk tin, a cartridge clip, and a bit of rag. When you had any olive oil, which was not often, 
These things would burn with a smoky flicker, about a quarter candle power, just enough to find your rifle by.' 